Thus far, we have covered the seven general types of water pollution, their sources and their impacts. Additionally, we have briefly looked at how we address water pollution in the environment and what we can all do to prevent and reduce water pollution. Next, I want to briefly address two types of water treatment designed to reduce pollution levels, wastewater treatment and also drinking water purification. And then lastly, we'll consider a couple of important laws regarding water pollution. First, we'll deal with municipal sewage treatment, which can also be called wastewater treatment, and actually is now also commonly called water recycling, because we understand the water is simply being cleaned to be reused. In fact, sometimes, as in the case of Orange County's toilet to tap program, the water is even used again fairly quickly for very pristine uses like drinking water. For the rest of this video, I'm going to call the process wastewater treatment. And again, as what this is, is this is everything that goes down the drains at your homes and at businesses and restaurants, etc., that goes down from toilets and sinks and showers and goes down into the sanitary sewer, not the storm sewer, and goes to a wastewater treatment plant for treatment. So right now we're going to look at the wastewater treatment process. In general, the wastewater treatment process has four steps. And I encourage you to go back to chapter 14 in your textbook uh, where they talked about wastewater treatment. The first step is primary treatment, which is a physical process that allows solids to settle and greases to float so that both can be removed. The second step is secondary treatment, which is a biological process that uses naturally occurring microorganisms to remove organic material and nutrients. Basically, air is bubbled up through the water so that the organisms have enough oxygen to do their work. Tertiary treatments vary and are not always required. It depends on where the water will be released. Tertiary treatment is any advanced treatment. Um, carbon filters are sometimes used. Um, wetlands are sometimes used. There's a variety of different treatment methods that could qualify as tertiary treatment. And then lastly, disinfection, um, which kills bacteria, including disease-causing organisms. Generally, chlorine is used, or some sort of chlorine compound, but there are a lot of environmental and health concerns related to chlorine, and some municipalities are now using ozone or ultraviolet light. Here's a schematic of a typical treatment process. The specific treatment process depends on the system and on where the treated wastewater will be reintroduced into the environment. Federal law mandates that primary and secondary treatment are used as well as disinfection. Primary is always the first step in the treatment process. This is a physical separation, as we said, where the solids are allowed to settle and the greases float to the top. So it's just simply a matter of letting the water be still. After that process, it goes on to secondary treatment. In secondary treatment, there's several different technologies that can be used, but in general, air is bubbled up through the water, and that facilitates decomposition. After the water has been aerated for quite some time, and the bacteria have done their job of degrading a lot of carbon compounds and turning them into CO2. Then the water goes into the clarifier, which is the second part of secondary here, and it is allowed again to simply settle. And the solids settle out, and some of those solids are bacteria that are put right back into the aeration tank again. And the, the water, which is now fairly clean, goes on to disinfection or tertiary treatment, depending on the plant. In some cases, after disinfection with chlorine in this case, but sometimes with UV light or ozone, the water is then released to the environment or used for irrigation. Um, in some plants, the tertiary treatment is done after disinfection, and some plants it's done before. Part of your assignment this week is to figure out where and how your wastewater from your home is treated. You will also be asked to figure out what happens to the water after it is treated. Generally, it's either released to natural water bodies, 
the ocean, the bay, or a river, or it's used for local irrigation. But you'll have to see what's done in your community. And you'll also be asked to figure out what happens to the, to the sludge, or now more commonly called the biosolids, after treatment. All the solids that get separated out at the wastewater treatment plant go through a process called anaerobic digestion, where bacteria that are not using oxygen consume a great deal of the carbon compounds within the waste and convert it into methane gas, which has to be collected and is often used as a fuel source for the plant. After a digestion, though, there's still solids that are present as a waste product, and they need to be dealt with. Sometimes they're used directly on, on non-food crops as a fertilizer. Sometimes they're composted and thus turned into a soil amendment that can be used on non-food crops and on food crops. They used to simply be dumped in the ocean, but we don't do that anymore. And then, currently, most biosolids um, in areas that don't have a lot of agriculture get dumped into landfills. Now, to be fair, they're actually used as daily cover, so they're not totally wasted when they're dumped into landfills. But most people would agree there's a lot of nutrients in those biosolids, and they could probably be put to better use than simply being dumped in a landfill. For most people, once the water goes down the drain, or once they've flushed, they no longer think about what happens to their wastewater. But we should. In fact, we should be thinking about it even before it goes down the drain and before we flush, so that we can make this process run more effectively to reduce pollution and also to make the process cheaper to save ourselves some money as taxpayers. Two simple things we can do is to make sure that we don't put toxic things down the drain. The only thing that should leave our house through our sanitary sewers is water, toilet paper, and human waste. Of course, there will be the occasional soaps and materials that we wash off ourselves, like lotions and sunscreens and cosmetics, but we should do our best to use biodegradable and non-toxic types of materials. Also, the less water that we put down the drain, the less water that needs to be treated at the wastewater treatment plant. So anything we can do to conserve water will help the process as well. The other type of water treatment that's important for each and every one of us is drinking water purification. So don't get these two mixed up. Wastewater treatment is the treatment that happens to the water that we're emitting from our households through our drains and our toilets. Drinking water treatment is the treatment that occurs before the water gets to our house to make it suitable for us to drink. Drinking water purification differs from location to location. And the typical steps are those that I'm going to list here. Though, as I'm going to point out, not every step is used in every treatment plant. I'll explain. The first step, of course, is always to collect the water and store it somewhere. In California, that's often collecting water from a river and storing it behind a dam. But you could also be taking groundwater, and you could, in, in the future, we may be taking ocean water that we desalinate. Next, typically, is coagulation and filtration. Coagulation is, is getting the organic particles and sediment to clump together. And we do this by adding other compounds to the water that entice the particles to do this. And then once they're clumped together, we can filter the water to make it cleaner. Notably, there are some water sources that are clean enough that they're actually exempt from the coagulation and filtration requirements. The next step is to raise the pH. We raise the pH to make the water less acidic. When water is more acidic, it is able to dissolve substances more easily, including metals and it can actually leach some of the metals from the water pipes into the water. If you follow the tragedy in Flint, Michigan, this is the step that was not being done in Flint. They weren't raising the pH of the water enough, and it was slightly acidic, and it ended up dissolving 
some of their pipes, which unfortunately were still very old lead pipes, and lead is a neurotoxin. So the people of Flint were being exposed daily to the neurotoxin of lead because their water managers did not raise the pH of the water sufficiently. Because the water actually damaged the pipes, in order to fix this situation, is what they're doing in Flint is replacing all the old water pipes, which as you can imagine for an entire city is quite expensive. The last step is disinfection, which is to kill the disease-causing organisms that may be in the water. Generally, this is done with some sort of chlorine compound. Not only does this kill any potential disease-causing organisms in the water at the treatment plant, but also the water is given a high enough dose of chlorine that that chlorine stays active within the water as it travels through the pipes and gets stored in water towers and makes it to your home. So, in summary, the water must be collected and stored. Some water sources have to be coagulated and filtered, and all water needs to have a pH, pH adjustment and disinfection. Then I guess the last step, which I've already mentioned, is distribution through a series of pipes and water towers throughout your community. Part of your assignment this week will be to determine where and how the drinking water that comes into your home is treated. Lastly, I want to briefly mention our two most important water quality related laws, the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. In general, the Clean Water Act works to improve the quality of rivers, lakes, aquifers, estuaries, and coastal waters. It attempts to eliminate discharge of pollutants into U.S. waterways without a permit and to return our waterways to fishable and swimmable conditions. We have a long way to go on that. Not surprisingly, the Clean Water Act had its roots in the 1970s when it was first passed as the Water Pollution Control Act of 1972. It has been amended several times since then. And notably, the act first dealt with point source pollution, and in 1987 it was amended to better address non-point sources. A few of the key provisions of the Clean Water Act include requiring the EPA to develop water quality standards for surface water, making it illegal to discharge without a permit, establishing a national pollution discharge elimination system, and providing funding to states and municipalities for the construction of sewage treatment plants, etc. One current problem with the law, and many laws related to the EPA, is a dire lack of funding. We can make all sorts of good laws, but if Congress does not allocate funds, the laws will not be enforced and likely will not be followed. To learn more, check out the EPA's website and look up the Clean Water Act. The other very important law re regarding water is the Safe Drinking Water Act. In general, the Safe Drinking Water Act sets uniform federal standards for drinking water to guarantee a safe public water supply. P prior to the Safe Drinking Water Act, each state set its own standards. You can imagine some were much higher than others. This law was passed in the 1970s as well, in 1974 to be precise, and basically, among other things, the law requires the EPA to determine what contaminants should be tested for in drinking water and to set maximum contaminant levels, MCLs, for these contaminants. They set primary standards, which are designed to protect human health and include about 90 contaminants, and they, they set secondary standards, which are set for contaminants that don't pose a health risk, but rather pose ecological or aesthetic problems. The Safe Drinking Water Act has been amended a few times. Notably, the 1996 amendments required that municipal water suppliers tell their consumers what contaminants are present in their city's water and if these contaminants pose a health risk. This is why you now receive a water quality report, called a Consumer Confidence Report, from your water supplier by mail every year. As part of your assignment for this week, you will be asked to find and analyze your household's consumer confidence report. 